Welcome to Tech in the Right Direction, the podcast. Let's take tech in the right direction to drive social change and close the employment, pay, and culture gap for women in technology. This podcast is focused on helping turn ideas into action to create opportunities for women to advance in the dynamic technology industry. I hope this podcast will inspire and motivate you to encourage more women and girls to seek or grow a career as a woman in technology. Stories about the journey of amazing women in this tech field starts right now. Welcome to Tech in the Right Direction, the podcast. This week, I'll be speaking with Kaylee Adams. Kaylee is the founder and creative director of Wiles District, a New York City-based design studio that specializes in emerging women and e-commerce brands. Wiles District works closely with founders to build meaningful experiences that span multiple touch points, including brand, web, app, print, packaging, and more. Kaylee has over a decade of experience working with some of the world's most celebrated brands, including Chanel, The Row, Rolex, Warby Parker, Birchbox, Ralph Lauren, and Barkbox. After spending years building larger brands, she turned her focus to working with early stage companies to help them navigate the many phases and challenges of brand development from pre-launch to post-launch life and created Wilds District in 2018. Today, she leads the Wild District team and partners with founders to help build brands from the ground up with visually compelling but scalable design. Their client includes some of the most of the moment names today, including Andy Swim, Orate, Chief, Claire Paint, Coterie, Elix Healing, Kin Eurofix, and Margot. Welcome to the show, Kaylee. So happy to have you on. Thanks so much. It's so good to uh, be on here. Thank you for um, having me on the podcast. I've been listening to a couple episodes and I've really enjoyed what I've heard so far. So happy to be here. That's great. Well, thank you. Um, So, Kaylee, as a woman in tech, can you share with us your career journey and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, so I started my career actually not in tech, which was interesting. I started um, in the design field and um, mostly within kind of traditional design mediums. So things like print and packaging design, um, branding and all of that, and then kind of stumbled my way into tech um, naturally over time throughout the year. So as as more needs arose for doing um, website design, I started to do a lot more of that earlier on. And in the earlier years, it wasn't something that a lot of people were doing. So it was pretty new, um, which I was lucky, I think, to have that timing because it was um, something I could find my way into. I think it's a little bit more challenging these days when so many people are experts in the um, in the in the field. But Yeah, so I started doing a lot more website design. Um, For many years, I was working in agencies, working across different clients, a lot of um, big uh, fashion and luxury type of clients in my earlier days. And then I switched into um, working for an in-house company. I worked um, at Birchbox for a time. And um, that was a really good transition because it also brought me a little bit more into the tech world, working for a startup and working specifically on their product design team. And um, yeah, from there, I, I my journey is kind of long and winding, but I um, uh, eventually, after many years working kind of agency side, in-house, pretty much the, the whole gamut, I decided to start my studio and um, have been doing that for the last five years or so. That's great. You know, many, many women start out their tech career, but not in tech. They start somewhere else and then they move into tech. So that's pretty common. Yeah, Um, that's great. It sounds like a great journey. So tell tell us more about Wiles District. Yeah, so we um, are a small design studio. We're based in New York City and we um, are a team of women. We work primarily with women entrepreneurs and women founders to launch their businesses. So Um, We really focus 
with a lot of clients that are kind of still in that luxury and lifestyle uh, world. And we work with them to do um, everything from branding design to digital uh, web, web design, app design, um, packaging, the full suite of design um, services. But really where our perfect niche is, is fusing the best in class technology with that premium aesthetic and, and more luxury type of design aesthetic. Um, and from my past, you know, kind of being in the luxury world, what I've noticed is that a lot of the times there's a lot of focus in this in this world on um, aesthetics and making things look beautiful, but there's not always a heavy emphasis on technology and making things convert, making things actually function and work really well. Um, so, you know, on one hand, you see companies like Twitter, for instance, that are very tech uh, forward, but maybe not the most beautiful platform you've ever spent time on. Um, and then you have a lot of these heritage sites like Chanel, for instance, I think they are doing pretty well with technology recently, but, you know, five years ago, they were really um, not as strong in that department. They built a lot of beautiful campaigns, but not necessarily really good platforms. So that's when, whenever we're doing even branding work or print work, we're always keeping in mind how it can translate into the digital realm. And that's um, our, our kind of sweet spot of expertise, bringing the uh, traditional aesthetics in with best in class technology. I love that. I love that you're combining technology with luxury, because I think there is that gap or there was, I don't know anymore, but mm -hmm. I think there definitely was the gap of you know, if it was a luxury brand for women, then technology was lacking or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I think this is really good. Tell me about how you got the inspiration for the name. So uh, Wilds District is an area of Maine where I'm from originally. It's um, I'm from Kennebunkport, Maine, and it's always been a it's it's a great area that's kind of the more local area of town and. Um, I just liked it for its its kind of background and, and mystique. It's it's got kind of a bunch of funny backstories. I think there's a lot of different origin stories about how it got its name, but one among the funnier ones is that a shipwreck um, or a ship ran ashore, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, and and a monkey got off the ship and was running around. <laughs> so that's one of the crazier theories, I guess, <laughs> of Wild District. But I kind of liked that as a little um, nod to some irreverence and some fun. Um, I think it was kind of a, to me, it's like this kind of um, quirkiness and playfulness that's there. I think a lot of the people in the design world take themselves incredibly seriously. Um, <laughs> and so to me, something about the name and the, the place and that kind of um, special place it has in my heart um, made that feel like a very compelling choice of, of a name. I love that. That's so it has a history. It has a story. I yeah. think that's great. That's great. <laughs> so Kaylee, you know, branding, I know you know that branding is very critical to, to a company and also um, personal brand. I'm hearing more and more about you know, women and uh, entrepreneurs having their own personal brand that might be a little bit separated from the company brand. So can you talk a little bit about why branding is so critical, both to the company and to your personal brand? Definitely. I think within the branding world, I, you know, tech can really only go so far for your brand. Like, I think things like I had mentioned earlier, there are brands out there that work really hard to make things just kind of functional, but they don't really necessarily feel good when you're interacting with them. And so I think technology can can go pretty far in building a powerful business and brand that people want to interact with, but it really has its limitations. And in order for something to feel a little bit more human, a little bit more compelling for, for other people to engage with brands, I think that the branding does a lot of work to humanize brands. And I think you know, you mentioned the personal brand as well. I think that a lot of business, at least for me, a lot of business decisions kind of come from um, my personal philosophy and my personal experience. So I think that, um, you know, if you have a, a kind of personal thesis or a personal brand, for me, it's working with women and working in tech, which was kind of these um, that came out of a lot of experience and a lot of personal stories that I had over time. Um, I think that it's important to ground your business decisions also um, from a place of purpose. So, you know, making sure that they come from the heart and it's coming from your own experience. So in that way, you know, having a personal brand really um, 
can uh, further your your uh, your your actual brand in real life. And so for me, that's definitely come through throughout the years and um, my experience working in branding and, and design um, directly kind of led to this business. So I think that the two are very interchangeable for business owners a lot of the times. And I think that a lot of these um, brands that are really powerful out there come from a deep place of purpose for people that tie back into their own personal brand and philosophy. I think that's so true. And, you know, for me, being in the training business for over 30 years, um, and then I started to do a lot with women and underserved communities and minorities, trying to build them up from a skills perspective, it really has changed what my brand is. When people think of training and underserved communities or women in technology or, um, you know, minorities, they will think of me like immediately. So I've created that brand in the industry, which is kind of cool, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about your experience as a woman in a very male dominated field, right? Uh, What challenge have you faced and how have you overcome them? So I think it's an interesting place to to be in, kind of, um, especially being an agency owner or studio owner. Um, There's a statistic out there that only 1% of all agencies are run by women, which is pretty wild, Um, especially when you consider that, you know, 85% of the purchasing power in the U.S. is all women. So essentially what it boils down to is that there's a lot of these studios out there creating work that's supposed to resonate with women consumers, but it's it's created by men. So that inherently kind of feels a little off to me. And um, I think that my experience is definitely um, working in this industry where I think in most of my jobs in the past, I have been the only woman on the team very frequently. Um, you know, at Birchbox is a little different because it was a woman-led um, and women-run uh, business, but I think a lot of the other companies, particularly within studio context and advertising, they're, they're run by men. And what was interesting in my experience working in this type of um, industry was that I found myself um, really getting thrown on projects that were very, (laughs) like I kind of became a little bit of the token woman on the team a lot of the times. Um, And so you kind of could start to see that about how projects were delegated. A lot of the times I'd get invited to meetings um, that were with CEOs and founders of companies and um, really important people and um, a lot of the times, even when I was very junior, I was put on those meetings and I, I realized at a certain point that it's a lot of it was because I was the sole woman in the room. And so they were kind of bringing me along for that ride um, and to show their clients like, hey, look, you know, we have someone who speaks your language. But it was kind of bizarre at the same time. It felt like a weird um, it felt like a weird experience just to um be brought around in that context and um, be the only voice, uh, especially, you know, within the agency context, all of a lot of the clients that we were often working with were women. um, And, you know, they were working with these agencies that were all men. So that, that always, that experience really shaped the output of the work that I'm doing today. And I think that it's important to, you know, have people who are part of your audience really building your brand alongside with you. Um, And that was a main driver for Wilds District, really focusing on women's brands um, so that we can empower and work with women founders to build their brand alongside them instead of kind of like you know, be hired to do some guesswork. Um, And I think a lot of that is kind of starting to happen in the broader industry as a whole. You see a lot of movements for, um, you know, like um, black minority owned, you know, businesses, they're looking to hire agencies uh, that have people of color on their team. And I think that that's important. And it's really, especially if those are, if that's the audience that you're, you're, Um, marketing to, it's really important to have those people who are building your brand along with you at every step of the way who reflect that audience. That is absolutely 100% true. And I totally agree with that. So I have some questions. So um, when you're the sole woman in the room, I know it's weird and, you know, but did you have a voice at that table? Sometimes it really depended on the context. And, And I think a lot of it came down to really just my comfort level too. So I found that the, the, the higher I got in my career, you know, I felt a little bit more comfortable actually um, 
kind of chiming in. But in the earlier days, it was a lot harder for me to speak up proactively. And certainly people were not asking for my opinion at that time either. So it was kind of a double edged sword. And it was um, challenging, I think, sometimes to be um, to not really know if it was appropriate to speak up or not. Um, there were there was this one story that I, I tell a lot where I distinctly remember this this moment where I had um, flown out. We were working on a really nice shoe brand. Um, this is like 10 years, 15 years ago now. Um, we were working on a really high end shoe brand and I flew out to the headquarters with the team. And I was very junior at the time. Um, and I remember I was very silent throughout the whole meeting because I was very nervous and <laughs> just kind of mm -hmm. sat at the table. And then during a coffee break, um, the creative director of the company and I were chit chatting um, and kind of just loosely, loosely talking. And I made a, a joke about some you know, famous uh, Valentino heels, which were really popular and everywhere at the time. And it felt like we both had a really good laugh about it and it was great, but it was funny because out of the corner of my eye, I kind of um, saw my creative director, the, the people that I was working for at the time, kind of like elbowing each other uh, under the table, like, isn't this great? You know, look at the, the points we're getting. And I just felt like, wow, this is very mm -hmm. odd. <laughs> you know, on one hand, I didn't really have a voice in terms of like, or I didn't necessarily feel comfortable to speak up because I didn't know if it was my quote unquote place or not. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. on the other hand, I was having these um, conversations on the side where I could kind of feel like, oh, look, this is why we brought her. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's a weird thing to navigate sometimes. I wasn't always asked for my opinion. And sometimes there's a lot of backlash when women give opinions um, when they're not asked. And that's a challenge that I think a lot of women who particularly work in tech, I'm sure you hear this a lot too. It's like this um, question about like, well, how, how do you speak up in this type of um, atmosphere when do you know it, it it's okay and when do you feel comforted to to um to be able to say things especially in front of clients yeah it is really a tough dynamic but you know i look at it that maybe those experiences gave you a lot of a lot of learning moments that you could take into your business do you agree with that mm, yes absolutely absolutely yeah. i think it's kind of made me um really cognizant as well uh, when I'm you know, working with other people um, like younger designers and really trying to make space for them to um, ask questions and make space for them to um, give their thoughts. And a lot of the times, if, if you're working particularly with younger women too, sometimes there's a hesitation there. So you have to kind of work hard to really draw out um, some thoughts from people sometimes and make them feel comforted in doing so. And then the more you do that, the more people begin to speak up around you. And that's actually a very valuable thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. I was talking to a woman the other day and she's, you know, rose up the ranks within her organization and she's at a VP level now, but as she was rising up, they always had her, she was amazing at taking notes. And so they always had her take notes. Oh. And she said, I finally said, no, I'm not taking notes oh, anymore. That's the worst. They kept <laughs> asking her, I know, kept asking her to do so. Oh, and she was almost offended, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, and rightfully so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's wild. Oh my yeah. gosh. It, it's funny how sometimes those, those roles still do carry over, which is surprising. You don't expect it to. Um, mm -hmm. I noticed a really major shift, particularly when I moved. So I worked in Boston for a number of years, and then I mm -hmm. moved to New York um, and worked in New York, and that's where I am now. But in the earlier days in New York, when I first moved, I noticed a pretty stark difference in culture in term, in specifically within the advertising um, sector. I noticed that there were even fewer women working in New York, I think, because it's just such a high pace, you know, type of job. Um, and a lot of late nights and things like that. And so it was funny because at the time, Mad Men was a very popular show. And mm -hmm. I used to think that it was very exaggerated and a little bit, um, you know, it was fun to watch, but, you know, maybe a little bit over the top. But when I moved to New York, I found that like a lot of those tropes and those things still happen. A lot of the weird kind of sexist, uh, and it, it comes from environments where I think there just aren't a lot of women. And it's not because, well, sometimes it's because of, you know, discrimination. Um, but like mm -hmm. other times, it might just be a matter of creating a very inhospitable workplace. So, you know, if 
um, you have somebody working around the clock until three in the morning every night, which is what I was doing in those times. It was fine when I was in my twenties, but you know, I have a kid now and I don't think mm-hmm. that that's feasible for me. And it, so at a certain age, you, you kind of tend to get pushed out. Um, and so it's just interesting. I think when I was, um, coming to New York, seeing how those, those kind of Mad Men era tropes really actually do exist in just in different ways now. Yeah, it's it's interesting, really interesting, the yeah. dynamics that are still, I think, in some cultures. Some I'm I'm learning a lot about many, many men allies just don't know what to do. And sometimes there are some unconscious biases that they have to be aware of. So it's exactly. sometimes it's not intentional and it's not um, you know, to really conflict against women. It's just that they don't know. They don't know what to do or they don't know what to say or or they have some unconscious biases that they don't even know about that come yeah. out, you know? Yeah, so, and there's a lot to be said. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's a lot to be said too, kind of on that note of uh, uh, being a, a role model. If you Once you get to a certain position or certain high level, it becomes really hard if you're setting the tone for the rest of the team. So if um, the, the things that are keeping women out of your business is you know perhaps like a, a really rough workplace environment um, or really bad hours. If you're working till 3 a.m. every single night, and you're setting an example for your team about what's expected, and so mm-hmm. that you're it kind of in a way a part of it, 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 regardless of whether you're a man or a woman. I think like you know you you are to some extent responsible for the um, the environment that you create. Yeah, very true, very true, and I'm very con- conscientious of that. A lot of times. You know, I don't sleep well anymore. As you get older, you don't sleep through the night. <laughs> I think it's a cycle that you start like when you were a baby and then <laughs> it goes back to that. Uh, but I am very cautious not to send emails at two or three in the morning, you know, yeah. <laughs> because it makes people anxious. It's like, what's oh, going yeah. on? Why are you doing yeah. this? You know, so I'm very conscious of that. I so know. that's very true. <laughs> that's funny you say that because when I had my kid, you know, I was mm-hmm. um, awake really weird hours, obviously. And so, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the times I'm kind of up at three in the morning, um, feeding the baby and mm-hmm. I might be checking my phone and answering quick, quick couple emails here and there. But what I started doing is actually scheduling them. So I would answer yeah. them. It would feel good for me to get it off my plate, but I would schedule mm-hmm. it until, you know, nine or 10 in the morning, just so right. it's not like this pressure to be like, what is this? Does she expect me to answer at two in the morning? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very right. anxiety inducing to wake up to emails uh, right when you sign on. Right. No, very true. And that I've I've done that too, where I've scheduled <laughs> them. So it seems like it's coming at a normal hour. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's great. And I loved what you said about, you know, your customers need to have um, vendors, employees look like them, be the same, um, you know, so you have to have diversity on your team so oh. that you can, because your customers are diverse and that's, you know, they show that diverse, diversified teams are really profitable, much more profitable than none and business is healthier that way as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, this podcast is focused around bridging the culture, pay and employment gap for women in tech. What are you seeing from your lens today? in the industry? I think I'm, I'm seeing a lot of, a lot more women entering business, which is a really mm-hmm. positive thing. I think that, um, especially because we focus on businesses that are um, kind of new and emerging businesses. So a lot of startups or mid-sized businesses that are hoping to scale and really get to the next level. Um, I'm starting to see a lot of people enter into this that are, um, that are just more diverse, which is great. And I think that that also means that realistically at a lot of these companies, um, this, this type of, um, you know, situation is really not going to be uncommon anymore, which is great. And I think that investors are starting to kind of uh, catch on to this too. I think women led businesses are still dramatically underfunded. And Mm -hmm. uh, when you, you know, look at um, minority owned businesses, it's even more of a Mm -hmm. bleak picture. And, Mm -hmm. Um, I think that the more we start seeing these types of people out there that are launching their own businesses and building and scaling big things, um, it becomes more of a norm. It doesn't feel like a weird outlier. And I think that that goes a long way to bridge that um, culture and pay 
type of gap as well. So you can kind of get a sense that it's not an anomaly if a woman is is successful in business. It's it's just how it is. Yeah, so true. And I'm seeing that that trend as well, where, where more women are coming into business and to tech. Uh, but we have a long way to go. Like you said, even the funding sources are so slim. You know, I think it's only 3% right now of wow. uh, businesses that are VC funded. And that's that's just not enough. I mean, that's that's yeah. wrong. So, but I think things are changing. I think we are seeing a lot of organizations make very strong uh, leaps and bounds to get uh, DEI initiatives in their yeah. company. So I, I really feel better about it. We just have to keep working on it. Mm-hmm. I agree. Absolutely. A hundred percent. So, you know, you've gone through a lot of experiences through your career. Uh, what are some tips and tools for women to navigate a career in tech? Because, you know, there some of our listeners might be thinking, I, th- this sounds so great, but where do I start? What is, who can help me? Those types of things. Um, and what does that future look like for women in tech? I think that I, I hit on this a little bit earlier mm-hmm. on, but I think one piece of, of um, or I guess a tip that I would have, especially for women earlier in their career, um, I think be, just not being afraid to speak your mind is really crucial. I think that I still struggle with this a lot. I think it's something that um, everyone is trying to work on. I think, especially if you have any kind of self-doubt or imposter syndrome that can creep in, it's tough to be able to speak your mind and feel okay and, and good about that. Sometimes even just speaking your mind and saying something might make you feel <laughs> sick to your stomach. If it's like a very, you know, you're like, I just put myself out there. It's a really scary thing, but, um, I think for women navigating careers in tech and design, um, it's important. I think the times where I have kind of felt the most lost and disconnected from my true self were times where I just stopped speaking up. Um, Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was just in climates of of, uh, previous jobs where, you know, it wasn't really... um, not necessarily rewarded, but it it didn't seem like um, speaking up was really uh, um, helping. Um, and so it became a thing where it, I started to speak up less and I became more and more unhappy. And then I started feeling very different and disconnected from myself. Like I had no voice or I had no say in things. And I think that, um, yes, it was a situation that could have changed, but it also was was realistically me when I look back on it, it I kind of I stopped speaking up and I think that's mm-hmm. on me and I think that um, it's important to kind of get your opinions out there um, and it's a really hard thing it's easier said than done to um, put your opinion out there especially when people are consistently saying no um, or kind of like fighting you on things um, so speaking up and just trying to stick to your guns and trying to um, keep pushing, even if you get rejection or, or no's back is really um, important. And then just know too, that if you do get a lot of no's or a lot of pushback, you just might not be in the right environment or climate. Um, I know that in the past, kind of the, the, the moment I was mentioning to you about when I changed my context and changed jobs, I, it really just changed my whole world again. I started to feel a lot more confident. I was speaking out again. Um, and so sometimes it's like hard to keep believing in yourself and um, it's easy to let doubt creep in. But I think it's um, something that you should actively work on and, and know that it's going to be hard. <laughs> right. um, that's a big that's a big thing for me, I think. Um is just being able to try to understand that it's a process and understand that you'll get better at it over time. And um, even if it's hard, it's it's the right thing to do. Yeah, that's so true. Um, I think we've all gone through that. Have you had a mentor throughout your journey? I'd say I, I, I haven't really had any formal mentors um, in the design community. I, really, I think um, it's something I've struggled with mostly because like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the places that I um, worked at, I couldn't really see myself in any of the leadership. Um, Mm -hmm. There were, it wasn't until maybe like five years ago that I actually worked for a woman, um, which was wild um, (laughs) for Mm -hmm. the first time. And so, I mean, you know, direct as like a, you know, someone running their company or the Mm -hmm. kind of direct 
before. So like I was always looking up to these people, but it was hard to see me kind of filling their shoes or be stepping into their lives. And so as such, I think a lot, I didn't really have a whole lot of mentorship, but I will say that I get a lot of inspiration and energy from um, other women entrepreneurs out there in the world. Um, that's really where I get my um, strength and a lot of my um, drive is seeing people doing really cool things. And um, for me, a lot of the times when we might be pitching on business and we lose the business for whatever reason, be it cost or timeline or whatever, um, I often find myself reaching out to the founders after and saying, you know, I, I understand, thank you so much, but hey, would you still want to get coffee? And so actually, a lot of the people that I have met, a lot of the women peers in business and a lot of entrepreneurs have become some of my closer friends, which is really great. And it's just a, it's something I try to do for myself to surround myself with um, women who are building great things um, as a way to keep myself going and, and stay inspired and stay energized. Because when I see other people doing really cool things and constantly pushing, even when it's hard, um, it really, really um, gives me a lot of energy to, to keep going in my own life and career. That's great. And I love that you reach out to, you know, other women entrepreneurs, even if you didn't get the business to say, hey, let's have coffee. Let's just yep. build a relationship. Let's have a friendship. And I love that because I do the same thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's great because you learn from each other every day. I learn from everybody. So Yeah. And that was another thing I had to kind of get over, too, is just this feeling of like, is that weird? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I didn't no. want to come off as like a weirdo, but at the same time, I really was like, Hey, um, you know, do you want to hang out? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I have to say that people are very open to it because everybody kind of wants the same thing, but it, I'd love to hang out with you when I come to New York or if you I come, know. To Canada, come <laughs> <Likewise>. see me. <laughs> I know. Likewise. I know. <laughs> That's fun. That's really fun. So you kind of <laughs> talked about um, who inspires you and why, and I was going to ask you a little bit about that. Is there anybody else, Kaylee, that comes to mind that has really inspired you in the past or currently? I mean, like I was saying, just a lot of uh, women um, business owners and entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. I think seeing their stories and successes makes me feel really excited. Um, I also just see a lot of, I get a lot of inspiration from women out there who are also parents juggling um, motherhood and career. That's something that's just very tricky mm -hmm. to navigate. And as a new mother, it's, it's a challenge to try to find out how to hit that stride sometimes. And so when I see other people who are, um, not only raising children, but still working on something, pushing towards some sort of greater goal. I think that that's really inspiring, especially um, knowing that as, if you're an entrepreneur, a lot of the times you get up in the morning and you've got to, you have to do your work and um, no one's really making you do it necessarily. Like you may have investors or whatever, but it's not like having a full-time job where someone's checking in on you and making sure you're making progress. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of initiative and a lot of drive and momentum to be able to do that. And over time to do that too, that's a really big challenge to kind of maintain um, a, a cadence and try to keep pushing, even though things are hard and things um, are even harder and more crazy with kids. <laughs> Yeah. And women are so good at, you know, taking on all the all the work in the world and getting yeah. it done, whether it's midnight or two o'clock in the morning, we're figuring it out. And I exactly. love that you said that, you know, motherhood and career balance is really, really tough. And I have two daughters that do that every day. And I just really respect and admire them because they have a very strong work ethic. They get everything done. Uh, they take care of their kids beautifully, you know, and do the right thing always. So it's really good. Really good to see that. That's Definitely so nice. An inspiration. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So how are fashion and beauty brands using tech today? How are you incorporating tech into uh, what you do? I, th so I think tech can enable a lot of really interesting things. Um, particularly when you start working within app development and design, or um, I think we're starting to see a whole other world open up, especially around Web3 and NFTs and all of that, where people, have, mm -hmm. there's, it's a very buzzy subject matter um, mm -hmm. right now. Obviously, I think that like 
there's a lot of potential there and it's really cool. A lot of fashion and beauty brands are still trying to navigate that landscape. I think I saw that, you know, Snapchat is using a lot more AR tech for t- virtual try-ons, which is going to be really exciting. Um, I think like uh, about a month or two ago, I purchased purchased an NFT that allows you to try on a kind of virtual skin. And so I see a lot of that mm. in terms of potential for beauty in particular, like trying on different shades or unlocking new types of technology, um, ways to, to preview um, brands and offerings in that sense, which is great. Um, but aside from that, there's just kind of the standard, I think tech enables a lot of really interesting, just standard practices outside of the, the whole kind of buzzy web three thing. You know, I think you look, can look at Telfar, for example, they're uh, amazing um, handbag brand and they do these incredible limited edition drops. And that's all made possible by really good technology that's allowing the timing of all this to happen. And they've just been doing a lot of really cool stuff around um, messaging to their consumers. Um, even stuff like that we tend to overlook, but just messaging mm-hmm. tools and platforms um, allow us to have a greater reach to our consumers now. So with hot commodities, especially like limited edition fashion items, um, I think that the technology really allows us to message to people when that's coming out, get build the hype, build the excitement, and also kind of manage when those releases happen. And, and um, it, it does a lot for um, both kind of like purchases, obviously, in terms of conversion, but it does a lot for brand building as well. And I think that a lot of the technology that's out there now, that's it just really enables people to get excited about brands and experience brands in a new way that um, goes way beyond uh, just visiting a store. It becomes more about brand loyalty. And so, you know, there's a lot of kind of frontier technology that's out there right now that people are talking about, like I mentioned, but the everyday technology of a lot of like push notifications and email type of things, um, t- email marketing, I, I think a lot of that um, is also just doing a lot in our day-to-day lives that um, sometimes is is a little bit more overlooked. Yeah, I think, you know, um, keeping that connection uh, technology is so good to nurture the customer, but definitely building your brand, like you said, is amazing. I'm pretty intrigued by the virtual skin stuff, so I will... <laughs> I have to learn more about that at some point. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was it was a very cool. As I think they were saying it, it was part of um, South by Southwest, and it was uh, mm-hmm. a virtual um, kind of skin try on. It was they were marketing it as kind of the first um, NFT that you could try on. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not so sold on the end success of it and how it works um, mm-hmm. because in mm-hmm. the end of the at the end of the day, it's just kind of a, a novelty in that sense. But there's a lot of possibilities should the technology catch up for um, this to be a really, really powerful tool for a lot of brands, particularly within the beauty industry. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's just innovation. You know, it's not there yet. It's probably not, not you know, something everybody's going to rush out and do. But I think... Right. It definitely is innovation. And I love that. You know, in 10 years, we'll be looking back and saying, wow, we never thought anybody could do these kinds of things. You know, I mean, look, <laughs> look at where we are today with technology. I, you know, mm-hmm. our phone has replaced so many different things and it's just, it's crazy. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's wild to even think about how our norms will shift to. I think a lot mm-hmm. of people are, kind of, especially, you know, going back to the whole metaverse web three um, conversation that a lot of people are having right now, like the the thought to a lot of people of, of like buying virtual outfits to wear in a virtual world is just bizarre. Um, mm-hmm. But when you actually have an application for it, like I, I you know I, I got into Roblox for a while and it was kind of fun and interesting, and I found myself buying up every outfit I could get, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's just it's just really fun and it might just become part of your daily norm, and it's something that seems bizarre and. Um, unlikely right now, but it definitely, technology can change so much so quickly and all of our kind of societal norms and day-to-day can shift so quick too. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's amazing to see. I love technology and love the things that we do today that we never even thought would be possible. Look at all the driverless cars that are starting oh to come out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd never have guessed that, you know. <laughs> I know. 
Crazy. Um, <laughs> well, Kaylee, I could talk to you forever. Right. <laughs> this is such a great, like great, <laughs> yeah, maybe great it's time. Actually, and we definitely have here. to continue. Yeah, <laughs> likewise. And I would love to do coffee or a glass of wine with you at some point. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Down for both. That sounds great. <laughs> okay, sounds good. So yeah. share with our listeners how they can get a hold of you. Uh, so yeah, you could reach out. So our website is wildsdistrict.com. Um, W-I-L-D-E-S district.com. And then we're at Wilds District on Instagram. And you can also shoot me an email directly if you want to, Kaylee at wildsdistrict.com. That's great. Well, this was such a pleasure to have you and an honor to have you on the show. Likewise. Um, let's Thank let's do this again sometime soon. Absolutely. That sounds wonderful. Thanks so much again for having me. And I um, I'm really excited to keep hearing the rest of the episodes that come out and really excited to keep you know, keep hearing from you. Great. No, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Thank you for listening to Tech in the Right Direction. Please take a minute to subscribe or follow so that you never miss an episode. Also, don't forget to like, share, and comment. Thank you. See you next week. From IT skill enhancements to end user adoption training, Directions Training is your resource to help optimize the effectiveness of your technology investments. Over half a million students have taken advantage of our wide selection of technology and business training solutions covering the most popular applications today, such as Microsoft 365, Azure, Windows 10, and more. As a podcast listener, we invite you to take advantage of an exclusive offer. Receive 30 days of free access to our Microsoft official curriculum on-demand courses for IT professionals or end users. Visit us at www.directionstraining.com slash podcast to claim this offer today. Hurry, this offer is only available for a limited time. Success is a journey. Ask for directions.